or we can turn cameras on and start. Okay. Um, so, welcome to today's seminar. Um, I am going to present uh, Michal Hajduk uh, to start with his presentation. And um, Dr. Hajduk is a psychologist at uh, the University Hospital Bratislava and associate professor of psychology at Comenius University. And in his research program, he uh, is focusing on individuals with severe mental illness, such as schizophrenia. And in his research, he's trying to understand how difficulties in processing social cues, such as facial expression and intentions, uh, can lead to pro problems in day-to-day -day interactions for this particular population. So um, yeah, go ahead, welcome. Okay, thank you for introduction. I hope you are seeing my presentation in, in right format. Okay, so uh, as you mentioned, I, I'm psychologist by training and my, my research program is usually about social cognition, but today I will speak about our project, which was recently started. And it's about implementation of digital mobile mental health across the Europe, because it's a huge uh, horizon project. And I will present some maybe background of our project and also some general ideas and methodology of the project. So when we look at just a few facts, uh, which uh, can help us to understand the context of this presentation. So we know that mental health problems are among the leading cause of disability worldwide. And when we look uh, at uh, problems like depression, anxiety disorders, or substance abuse disorder, especially alcohol use disorder, we know that uh, they are very, very common. And especially during the last few years, uh, we, uh, we spotted the increase in prevalence due to COVID. We know that some people uh, bounce back to the normal, but some of them uh, have some ongoing issues with mental health problems. But there is also one huge problem, which is uh, very common across the Europe, and we usually do not have uh, so many clinicians or people who are trained uh, in providing specific treatment for people with mental health. So we need to find a way how, how we can provide uh, evidence-based treatment for our patient. And it's a huge challenge for us. And maybe this is the reason why people uh, have started recently think about how maybe digital technologies can help us in providing better treatment or providing newer options, uh, how to tackle some clinical issues. And when we look at the surveys from, for, for example, United States, we know that in, uh, in advanced economics, about 75% of people, they have smartphones. In emerging economics, about 45%. But what is important for us uh, for today's presentation is that we know that about 60% of people with severe mental illness, they have smartphones. And this is a huge opportunity because uh, a lot of them can be uh, also treated with these technologies. And we, we know that there is still a gap because about 40% of them, they do not have uh, mobile phones. So we need to find another way. But I think this is the huge opportunity. And based on recent evidence, we know that these options are quite effective and feasible in this population. And we know that there are huge differences between standard care and maybe using some technologies in mental health, but it opened to us a lot of new possibilities, which are not present when we are doing regular clinical examination. For example, when we visit, uh, when our patient visit us and, and they can ask about, we can ask them about how they felt during the last two weeks or the last month, it's very difficult for them, and it's uh, it's difficult because they, there is problem with the recall bias, so they can recall a few last days, but this information might be more blurred, and uh, these digital technologies can help us to understand their behavior and experience in far more details. For example, we can receive very we can receive longitudinal data from several days, 
or some several points within one day, which are very dense, that they can be multimodal. For example, we can receive data about some, uh, some aspects of mood, for example, how they felt, but we can combine it with the information from the activity uh, from the smartwatch. So it's, it's a huge opportunity to, to have a very, very complex assessment, a very rich source of information, which can be used later in predicting their problems. And during the recent years, we also uh, 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 found out that machine learning algorithms can be very useful also in medical setting, and they can help us to, to estimate some predictions about individual patients, about their treatment, and it's very useful. So we can predict that we can, we can, uh, we can prevent things in the future. And the last point, I think it's very important because all these new digital technologies can uh, open us some new new opportunities, which can improve uh, cooperation between clinicians and the patients, and uh, is also the the mean how we can personalize treatment with our patient because it can be personalized to the needs of the patient. So all these things are advantages of uh, digital technologies or mobile technologies, but the question is how it can be implemented into regular clinical practice. I mentioned it before, I think precise monitoring is very important. During uh, When we are using smartphones or smartwatches, we can get a lot of information about, for example, mood, about social context, if people are alone or with other people, if they uh, respond to the questionnaire during uh, with their uh, smartphone. We can also uh, uh, we can also get another things which are I think important for uh, from therapeutic perspective and we can try uh, to empowerment uh, our patients so they can be part of the treatment they can they can they can have access to their response to this questionnaire or to this information and they can together with the clinicians decide what is the best uh, treatment goal for them and this is very important uh, also uh, for for successfulness of the treatment in, in general so this was a very brief introduction but now i would like to speak more about our project which is a very very huge project because it's uh, across the europe so it was uh, supported by european union and uh, this project is called immerse so it's implementing mobile mental health recording strategy for the europe and we, tr we try to implement digital mobile mental health uh, across the Europe, more specifically in Belgium, Germany, Scotland, and Slovakia. So you can see these countries are quite diverse. In, and uh, I think what is interesting about this project is that these countries are different, especially in, in a way how they, uh, in uh, how much experience people in these countries have with uh, digital mobile mental health, especially Slovak Republic. I think we are only in the beginning, so we usually do not have experience. It's very difficult also for clinicians, for example, to understand this, uh, that uh, digital mental health can be a huge opportunity to them. So I think on the other hand, this is this is a great opportunity because we can, we can share our experience and we can provide uh, some useful information. So our pr my primary aim within this project is we would like to switch uh, the treatment of mental health into more person-centered approach. And during the pro uh, our project, we'd like to support our service users so they can be more engaged in their treatment. They can be active members, they can share their thoughts and consult more with their clinicians. But we would also like to encourage our clinicians to, to be maybe more open to use these technologies. We know that uh, also using technologies and mental health can have a lot of obstacles, for example, privacy issues can be a huge problem, but I think together with a huge team, we can, we can maybe fight this obstacle and find a way how it can be implemented. I need to take, uh, I need to give, give credit to uh, other members because uh, this is project is very large. I think this is the largest project I've ever, ever been. In, and we have a lot of very uh, interesting people from Belgium, Scotland, Germany, and it's pure, uh, purely uh, interdisciplinary project. And our aim's aim is very broad, so it, we are looking uh, on several aspects. I will tell tell you later. 
So our project is divided into two parts. Uh, uh, we already finished the first part, it was participatory field study. So we'd like to map uh, maybe opinions, uh, experience uh, about using, men uh, using digital technologies in mental health. And we used a large survey and also uh, uh, interviews. And our goal was to understand how, how important people in this process think about this topic, about the digital mental health. So we surveyed uh, service users, clinicians, also people who are uh, family members of people who is somebody who is treated for mental health problems, but also people who are managers in uh, terms of uh, mental health. So for example, head of department and all these important people who are uh, important people who can decide whether or not this uh, these technologies can be implemented uh, within the treatment. Now we are in a phase when we are analyzing our data, so I hope that we'll soon have some results we can share with you. But all oh, this first study or first, first part of the project was very important because we received a lot of information which helped us to prepare for a second phase, which we are starting right now, and it's a uh, pragmatic multi-center parallel group cluster randomized control trials horrible and very long uh, uh, name for it but we are trying to implement uh, uh, digital mental health uh, across Europe so we ask for cooperation uh, at least I think two uh, two clinical sites per country and we are trying to to add uh, digital mental health uh, into regular treatment that we try to compare it with the threat treatment as usual. And we would like to see uh, whether these digital technologies can help, for example, uh, increase uh, shared decision-making or patient engage in engagement in a treatment. And the question is how we can implement uh, digital mental health. So we are combining two things. First is experience sampling or ecological monetary assessment. So we will we'll collect data from mobile phones. Uh, our patient will respond to regular questionnaires. And we also view some passive monitoring like actigraphy from smartphone and so on. But the second part, which is important for clinicians. So uh, in our project, we developed a dashboard, dashboard which was designed for clinicians and they will receive all this important information from the patient's answers and we, will, uh, we are trying to encourage them to discuss these findings with the patient. For example, patient is using uh, the smartphone for two weeks and uh, during the visit they can consult with, with the doctor about, for example, about the mood changes, problems with the sleep and all these important topics which are usually personalized for a patient. So it's important that the patient have opportunity to uh, say, okay, this is my treatment goal. For example, I can work on my sleep problems or I have very low self-esteem and together with the clinicians, they can work on it. And they have quite a lot of data uh, to make a very informed decision and maybe adjust the treatment uh, with this. Okay, so digital mental health in the practice have a lot of opportunities. For example, we can monitor treatment effects. So we can we can compare pre, uh, uh, results in the beginning of the treatment and after treatment. We can also uh, get some additional insight about how people function in everyday life. So we can ask about context. Or for example, we can ask about activities. How, and we can then report to the patient, look, it seems that during the last week, you usually spend your time alone or we can mention something that I saw that there is increase in some productive activity, for example, engaging with other people. And this is important information for a patient. And they, we can put it in the context of the current mood or other symptoms which are present. We can also test some hypotheses about, for example, what caused panic attacks or, or what happened in a day before a patient report problems with the sleep. All these information are very important. Or we can find some information about side effect of, side effect of medication. Uh, and I think the important aspect of our application is that the patient, they, they are the active part, part of the treatment and they, they set the goal and they can report how, how they work on their goals and if there are some changes in the improved or worsen during the day and they can consult with the, with the clinicians. So uh, in our dashboard, we try to develop some standard way how to report uh, for example, changes in the mood over the time, so patient and clinicians can work can work together. And if they, for example, saw the decrease in I don't know uh, 
positive emotions or increasing depressed mood, anhedonia, they can look and they can try to find out what is the context, what situational factors can lead to changes in the mood. So this can really inform uh, treatment decision of the patients and their clinicians. They can also ask information about uh, activities they did during uh, some specific period of time. But uh, what I think is very important and what is, I think, the main point in our project is that we know we developed this, uh, uh, this approach based on a lot of evidence and we try to prepare something which can be very uh, personalized. So we try to develop questionnaires which are like core questionnaires which are common for all of our patients but we enable our, our clinicians together with the patient to select, for example, I'm interested in monitoring this and that. For example, I'm interested in craving in people who have problems with substance abuse. And they can add additional question to the questionnaire and patients, they, they, they respond based on their treatment goals. There can be other patients with totally different treatment goals. So clinicians can adjust and, and change, uh, change questionnaire accordingly. And you can see like uh, all clinicians will have like three with the patients and they share something which is common. For example, we know that uh, across diagnostic boundaries, problems with the moods, uh, mood is it's quite common. For example, having depressed mood, anhedonia, also lack of positive emotions. But we know that each patient is specific. And I think the digital mental health can, can help us really to understand uh, individual needs of the patient and can really lead to improving the treatment of our patients. So that's all. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for a very interesting presentation and a super important topic. Um, yes, very interesting. So um, moving on to the next presentation, um, I, uh, I just want to add that Esther Metting will unfortunately not be able to give her presentation today. Uh, so the next uh, presentation we'll have is my own. And um, I'll just present myself briefly. I'm a PhD student at the uh, Center of uh, MedTech Science and Innovation at Uppsala University in Sweden. Um, my work is being done in a research group called Participatory eHealth and Health Data. Uh, which is led by my main supervisor, who is Maria Heglund. And my research focuses on patient access to their electronic health records. And I have a special focus on uh, access for children, parents, and adolescents. So um, let me just share my presentation. Mm. Yes. So, so yes, my name is Josephine Hextrom. And uh, in this talk uh, on the topic of health and digitalization, I'm going to talk about this online access to minor records, experiences among adolescents, parents, and healthcare professionals. So I already told you about my background a little bit. Um, I have background in language and psychology, and uh, these are this is my affiliation. Mm. And I'm located in Sweden. Actually, now I'm in the US, but I'm the Uppsala University is located in Sweden. So for today, I intend to give you some background on our project. I'll talk about um, patient accessible health records. What are they? And what is the issue that arises around minor records? Um, and I will present some study findings and lastly go into a bit what we're up to at the moment and what is in the pipeline for us. So in my PhD, I'm working with the Nord eHealth project where researchers and clinicians from five countries are collaborating in an effort to promote patients' online access to their records. And we are doing this because we believe there's a potential in uh, increasing patients' self-management and transparency in healthcare. So patient accessible electronic health records are common, commonly referred to as patient portals. And their implementation has been going on steadily for the last 20 years um, of ongoing digitalization in our uh, society. And uh, they often include health information such as notes, medications, test results, referrals, all types of 
information about the patient and uh, and these this phenomenon the patient portals have been found to improve patient self empowerment and one key issue when it comes to this topic is uh, access to minors records because um, when the child is young um, the child is dependent on the parent to act as so called proxy proxy for them making healthcare decisions and uh, and they have the responsibility for them. But as the child grows into an adolescent, they might want to start seeking healthcare with privacy from their parents for types of care that might be found extensive. And this can concern, for example, mental health, uh, reproductivity, sexuality, or domestic or sexual abuse. So there's a risk um, also in this that uh, the young people will withhold medically irrelevant information from their healthcare provider in case that they suspect or um, or fear that something will be revealed to their parents, such as through their records. And uh, one reason for this being a problem is that patient portals are usually not designed for parents and children, but rather for the adults and autonomous patients, where we have this traditionally dyadic relationship between, between the two. So during early childhood, there's still sort of a dyad because it's the parent who is the proxy for the child who's dependent. But as the child grows into an adolescent, uh, the relationship turns more into a triad between the three parties. And this complicates the use of patient portals um, when we want to ensure that this, uh, we can ensure safety for everyone involved. And um, these concerns often cause patient portals um, to exclude adolescents from having access altogether, which uh, I find to be a bit of a shame because teenagers are a group with a lot of potential. They are society's digital natives and they are on their way into adulthood. So giving them access to their records could be a, a way for at least some of them, if not all, to learn about their health and become responsible, uh, responsible uh, patients and adults at an earlier stage. So uh, just another issue um, is that circumstances and situations can, can differ so vastly uh, as not only is it important to protect the young patient's confidentiality, but there are also situations where you want to protect the caregiver's privacy from the young patient. And um, in addition, there are a variety of family constellations today, which requires uh, consideration when you want to provide access for parents or guardians or different types. And last but not least, parents of children, uh, parents or children or teenagers who are battling serious illness may have special needs in their access to the records. So the project, the aim of the project for me is to explore the experiences of online record access among adolescents, parents, and healthcare professionals, um, and also looking a bit at adoption and implementation. And uh, the studies that we have done so far. Um, in the first one I'm going to talk about, we call it collated previous research in a scoping review. Next, we systematically have compared approaches to implementation in four countries. And most recently, we conducted a national survey, gathering insights from users of the systems, um, there, including adolescents. And I'll begin just to describe the scoping review and what we found there. So we found uh, our search came down to 74 articles of which a good majority were from the US. Um, so most of uh, the scarce existing uh, research of adolescents is focusing on anticipations um, on having access rather than actual experiences because it's not very common for people to give uh, adolescents access yet. And um, among the benefits, we've seen that teenagers are highly interested in having access and they show adequate comprehension and satisfaction. On the other hand, they are, they lack knowledge often about having access and what, how to use portals. And they worry about not being able to understand that everything they read. So I'm also anticipating problems with their parents having access to their records. So among pa parents, um, the benefits that they see include uh, better being able to remember better um, and uh, having a feeling of control and experiencing less anxiety. And among concerns, um, they worry about receiving maybe bad news without having been contacted by anyone face-to-face -face and not understanding the information in the records. They also see benefits in having their adolescent accessing their notes. Still, they worry about that 
leaving them outside of the loop, so losing control. And for the part of the healthcare professionals, um, we have a majority of American studies as well. And um, yeah, so they see in a benefit in that patient parents can be helpful in, in identifying incorrect information. And uh, it can uh, reassure parents of the care provided. But also they are very concerned about the confidentiality in, in terms of the adolescent. So that is the major uh, concern for healthcare professionals. And in this study, we uh, looked at also differences between expectations and experiences. And I think uh, this was really interesting and it's really important to think about this with all research on digitalization and newly implemented inventions. So, um, um, yeah, so just that attitudes and expectations can vastly differ from the actual experiences uh, later on. So, to the next study is that we compared the um, approaches of four countries. And um, yeah, so there are today no guidelines for how to implement access to minors' records. And this is to a backdrop to the fact that health institutions in more than 20 countries are developing patient portals and patient access to their records. And um, regu regulations therefore differ in terms of, for example, when the parent loses access to their, um, to their child's um, records and also when the patient themselves gain access uh, to their own records. So uh, just, yeah, so these, these were the countries we looked at, Sweden, Norway, Finland, and Estonia, and they all have different national systems for their patients' record access online. And this is a visualization of this, uh, what we found. Uh, so we can see that in Finland and Estonia, parents are able to have access until the age of the child of 18, and there is no minimum age for children to have access. On the other hand, we have Sweden and Norway where there is a gap in access from or when, um, from when the fact that the point that parents lose access, which is about 13 years old, until the child turns 16 when they gain own access. And uh, as we can see in Sweden, it's possible to expire, apply for extended access for both parents and adolescents, but this process is quite tedious and requires a lot of time and awareness as it looks today. And this access gap in Norway and Sweden has led to a lot of criticism, especially among parents of children with serious illness. And as then most recently, we conducted a national survey in Sweden. Um, and in this uh, survey, which was available for three weeks on the national portal, we had about 13,000 responses. And about 200 of those were adolescents between 15 to 19 years old. So we also conducted the survey in the three other countries, Norway, Finland, and Estonia. So that um, allows for a comparison between countries in this data as well. And just for some preliminary results, we saw that um, more than half had not been encouraged by anyone to read their records among these adolescent participants. And uh, only a fifth had been encouraged by healthcare professionals. Um, and there were no gender differences. And the only relationship we found between frequency of actual self-reported use to being encouraged was for being encouraged by a physician, which indicated that those had, who had been encouraged by doctors were more frequent users. Uh, we also asked why they were reading the records. And we saw that the most common reasons were out of curiosity and uh, to get an overview, but um, uh, among the least nor, um, popular reasons were to share documents from the records with either healthcare professionals or with friends and because of uncertainty of not having received the correct care. And there were no gender differences in this regard. So we also asked how useful the adolescents consider various information. We saw that test results, clinical notes of different sorts and medications and referrals were the most useful to them. However, all types were considered relatively useful. Um, this is in contrast with the functions where the most um, useful functions according to the adolescent respondents were to uh, to be able to manage and order medical certificates and to contact the healthcare provider electronically. Um, and on the other hand, what they considered the least useful was to 
contribute with the expectations to um, um, on the healthcare visit and to contribute with health information and uh, manage services for family members, which isn't very surprising for this population. So that was uh, some completed studies that we've done. And I'm just going to move on to describing some of what we're doing now. And um, we were looking at a one vulnerable pop population of adolescents and parents, uh, which is adolescents with cancer. So we're doing a mixed method study that contains surveys, interviews, and focus groups online, because we want to see how the access gap that we have here is experienced by this group, and um, also other types of experiences of having online record access. And uh, some preliminary results, we're seeing that parents really appreciate being able to check the test results. Uh, that's the most important thing. And then this gap between 13 to 16 year old, 16 year, years old is really a problem. They think it's ridiculous. Um, but uh, they understand that it might not be useful or good for all parents to have access to all information during adolescence. But um, in their case, when their child is so sick, it's really critical. And I've um, heard from parents who have tried to apply for extended access, but they're una unable to attain it due to lack of information for the healthcare professionals. They're not, they don't know how to do it properly. So uh, for adolescents, I don't have enough data to provide any um, preliminary results. Some parents have said that their ch children just want to focus on um, normal life. They don't want to think about their illness. So I'm considering whether that could be a reason for them not wanting to participate. Um, and uh, among the healthcare professionals, we're seeing that doctors are more critical to record access for uh, adolescents and parents than nurses. And um, they are also concerned about not being able to explain findings and results, not face-to-face. -face. And we see that they have, as before indicated, a low knowledge about the possibilities to extend access for parents and adolescents, with 60% knowing about the possibility for parents and only 20% know about the possibility for adolescents. So, um, so just for some other studies that are in the pipeline, we are wanting to do an international survey comparison of these four countries that we um, conducted the survey in, in terms of adolescents. And then we're working on a case study looking at actual usage and uh, interest in uh, extending the access uh, to the records in Finland and in Sweden. And just for some updates on, um, on Sweden, and our framework here is that uh, the company that holds the National Record Systems platform um, has recently laid out a proposal for a change in this framework. Um, and with this, the gap that we are seeing today would be closed as, par um, as adolescents would have earlier access and parents longer access. But there is still um, reason to believe that such a change will take at least a few, a few years to actually happen. So, um, yes, this was it for my presentation today. And uh, thank you so much for your time. Um, yes. Um, yeah, so uh, if there is anyone who has a question, it's uh, open to ask them in the chat um, and uh, they will be forwarded to us. Okay, I see there is one question for me. So, uh, yeah, I think it's a very important point. Uh, yes, and maybe this is the reason why uh, Horizon Project usually try to uh, to put together countries with very different background. And I, I, I think I mentioned it before, it's, it's a huge, there are huge differences across healthcare system. So our project is more about implementation of digital mobile interventions in, into practice, not like digital uh, healthcare system uh, in general. But yes, there, there are differences. We are aware of it. And uh, this is also the result from our participate participant study that uh, people have different experiences, knowledge, and all these things, and we would like to put it together and compare these things because this cross cult trust I think this cross country uh, comparison will be also useful for other countries uh, will be interesting in implementing uh, similar things in their system.
Um, and then I know that um, Esther will be posting the link for the networking event that will take place after this in the chat. So feel free to join that. Um, so I can see the question here, if there's a reason for the gap that we see in Norway and having access. Um, there hasn't been, there usually isn't uh, that clear of um, explanations for why these systems are being implemented the way they are. It seems a bit arbitrary at times. Um, we know that it was implemented after it was in Sweden and um, the geographical closeness that you have to believe that they have some kind of um, um, correlation. But um, so in Sweden, we had, it was done because of um, uh, the fear of, um, yeah, just what I mentioned, like the fear of uh, the risk for the adolescents outweigh the potential or the benefits that could be, um, uh, that could be. So just uh, out of fear, they just um, leave a gap instead of uh, risking having situations where, for example, an adolescent mm, might want to seek care for reproductivity, like needing contraceptives, and then not um, wanting to do that because of the uh, access in the, of their parents to the records. So, um, so I don't know exactly what the reason specifically is for the gap in Norway, but I would imagine it's out of um, concern. So if there was a way to mitigate that, um, that would be ideal. But currently it, there is just a lack of investment in this field. So um, yes, so you, Alexander posted the link to the networking event. See you in the meeting. Yes, okay. Thank you so much and see you. Thank you.